Hello, and welcome to Policy Podcast with Dr. Pete, a podcast series going over the district's anti-discrimination policies. Today we'll be discussing the district's Title IX policy, and I'm joined with several guests today. First, Kamini. If you'd introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, I am uh, Kamini Waldman. I am a senior at Northampton High School, and I'm president of the Student Union. And Sabrina. Hi, I'm Sabrina Hopkins. Um, I'm a sophomore here at NHS, and I'm on the Student Union as well. And we're also joined by attorney Layla Taylor, who's the district's attorney. I'll start by saying that Title IX is one of the district's most technically complex policies. And um, attorney Taylor is someone who I go to for advice when I'm trying to understand uh, the protections under Title IX. So I think we're very fortunate to have her here today. And I think that um, you have an opportunity to ask your questions about Title IX from someone who understands this policy very deeply and who helped the district to craft its own policy with respect to Title IX. So I know you had some questions about dress code policy in the intersection with Title IX. Did you want to start with that? Um, yeah. So my question was kind of how does this policy work with dress code policies that are within like schools within the district so if like for example if someone was not following the dress code and then they were sexually harassed would they still be prote protected by the policy like will the policy protect against victim blaming and things like that that um that kind of because like dress code and sexual harassment can be very like intertwined um and yeah Sure. So uh, let me say there's nothing in Title IX that says in order to be protected by Title IX, you need to be compliant with the district's dress code policy. I'll start by saying that our dress code policy is um, quite limited. You know, it, it basically says that students need to wear shoes and that they need to dress in a way that um, does not disrupt the learning environment. But even if a student was not compliant with the district's dress code policy, they would still be protected under Title IX. Okay. Um, so I guess my question is just taking it uh, back a step, a little bit more broad, um, but just generally, uh, who developed this policy? Who um, went into making it? And then what was the review process like for this policy? Do you want me to take that? Sure. Okay, so um, in 2020, August of 2020, the federal go government actually changed, the Department of Education changed the um, regulation, the Title IX regulations, and how the process for Title IX work, uh, investigations had to take place. Um, and so that prompted the school committee, who is actually responsible um, for developing policy for the district um, to review it and make revisions pursuant to those new regulations. Um, and so what they first did is they went to the Rules and Policy Committee. Um, that's a subcommittee for the school committee. Um, they, they looked at what those new regulations were. I think they, my recollection is that they also got samples from um, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, um, which assists school committees in developing policies. Um, and they also conferred with me as their legal counsel, because um, I look at regulations every day. And um, they drafted the policies. I don't know how many readings they had of this. Usually they have three. They probably had at least two readings, I would think. Um, and then they brought it to the school committee, um, who also um, looked at the policy and ultimately voted on it. Um, and of course, uh, Superintendent Provost, um, through that process, also looks at it as well. So in other policy podcasts, I've talked about how many of our anti-discrimination policies, and in fact, all the policies of the district, have to be updated whenever there's a change of state or federal law or the regulations prom promulgated underneath those laws. And so this um, latest iteration um, went through that process that Attorney Taylor just said. Prior to that, there was another Title IX policy that also covered the same things. As I'm sitting here, it's occurring to me that we're talking about Title IX without really um, giving any detail on what the actual protections are. And so I think maybe this would be a good time to step back and go over what Title IX is intended to do and who it's intended to protect. If you could help us with oh, that. Oh, yeah, not a problem. <laughs> so Title IX has been around for a while. Um, it was originally enacted um, by the federal government to protect um, students and staff 
um, in any federally funded ed educational program from sex discrimination. Um, and in actually a couple of years ago, there was a Supreme Court case. It actually had to do with workplace discrimination under a different title, Title VII, um, but it was called Bostock. And um, in that case, the Supreme Court ultimately said that sex discrimination includes um, discrimination uh, against for individuals um, based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So the Department of Education, as of June of 2021, has officially stated that Title IX protects um, students and staff from um, sex discrimination in the schools, uh, discrimination based on um, sexual orientation and on gender identity. So it actually now protects on three different bases. Um, so that's actually a good change, I think. Um, the other thing that it does, it defines are three different types of sex discrimination. And again, there are th when I say it's sexual orientation, discrimination and harassment people are protected from, gender identity, and sex discrimination. It's all considered sex discrimination under Title IX, but there are still three different types. So the first type is what we call quid pro quo. It's when somebody conditions the receipt of an educational aid, service, or benefit on sexual favors. And that can run a set spectrum of things from dating, right? Saying, I won't you know, I won't give you an A if you don't go on a date with me, right? It could be something like that. It could be all the way to something like sexual activity, right? So it's a spectrum of stuff. That's called quid pro quo. Most Title IX discrimination um, and the complaints that we see are the second type, which is harassment. Um, and that's when, um, you know, the investigator and ultimately the deci decision maker in a Title IX claim determines that um, that somebody was denied access, equal access to educational programs or activities based on sex. And it was severe and it was um, unreasonable to an objective person. That's the legal standard. And then the third type is other forms of sexual violence, really. We're talking about rape. Um, dating violence, stalking, um, sexual assault, um, those, those sorts of things. So those are the three types of things uh, that fall under that broad um, umbrella of sex discrimination. So ultimately what Title IX says is if an individual or a group of individuals believe that they have been um, discriminated or harassed based on sex, that they can file a complaint. And there's a procedure um, that, again, has to be followed, uh, but a procedure um, for addressing that complaint. And if it is found to have happened, for there to be remedial action taken. Um, I mean, just hearing you talk about this, like this is a very layered policy. Very layered. <laughs> um, and and um, so what I am wondering about is just uh, communication with um, district members about this policy. I know that there's many policies that district members have to be aware of, especially I'm talking about like faculty and administration. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering kind of what that communication looks like, like when some when there is a disclosure made, when there is some kind of report, when an administration member hears something or a faculty member hears something, um, how do they know what to do? Like how, how is what is in this policy, this newly updated policy, um, how has it been um, like relayed, I guess, to uh, faculty and administration? So uh, one thing that the policy also requires is for every district to have a Title IX coordinator. Our district's Title IX coordinator is Lisa Saffron, who happens to have an office here in the high school. Um, whenever there is a, a allegation that could potentially be a Title IX complaint, there's obviously many times students or staff don't come forward and say, I'm asserting my rights under Title IX. They usually come forward and say, there's some type of behavior happening here and it doesn't feel right to me. And in the course of an investigation, usually another administrator will say, I, this, I'm getting too many red flags here that there's a potential Title IX situation, at which point it goes into the ballywick of the Title IX coordinator, who is Lisa Saffron. Now, um, under the newly updated policy, this is one of the things that I think is challenging for districts. 
to, um, to implement. Uh, major change has been that the investigator of the complaint and the decision maker uh, need to be two separate people. So one of the things that the Title IX coordinator does is to keep the process moving forward and trying to keep um, the different pieces um, moving forward according to timelines. So um, when something came to the attention of Lisa Safran, she would meet with the complainant and she'd meet with the um, individual who's known as the respondent, that's the person who's accused. And uh, would there are actually several um, required steps that need to take place at that level. Then an investigator would be assigned to, um, to look into the merits of the complaint and that person would do a report which that person would submit to the Title IX coordinator and that would then be shared with whoever's designated as the decision maker in the case. In most cases, the decision maker would be the principal of the school where the behavior is alleged to have taken place um, because the principal is the one who, if it's a matter that involves personnel, has the authority to impose discipline on personnel or if it's a matter that involves students is also the person who has the authority to impose discipline on students. Um, another question I had is, does this cover um, anything that may happen in after school activities or sports, for example, that may not even happen in that are still like facilitated through um, NPS? but happen at like other facilities off of like um, Northampton school grounds? Does this still protect people then? So that's a great question uh, because I think when many people think about Title IX, the first thing they think about is sports because uh, Title IX cases in, you know, many people's recollection of what this law means um, mm -hmm. began or were very popular, I would guess I'd say, in the area of student athletics. And one of the first protections that came through Title IX is making sure that student athletes who identify as male and student athletes who identify as female have access to equal opportunities through student athletic mm -hmm. programs. So um, I think for many administrators, when they hear Title IX, they default to athletics. So the policy definitely applies to athletics in any school related activity. Um, Obviously, it, it protects against the types of discrimination that Attorney Taylor was talking about, but also sort of in a larger sense, um, protects against or ensures access, ensures that students have equal access to programs and are not discriminated against based on sex. I just wanted to jump back to something you had said prior about kind of the decision making process. And I know you said, you know, the investigator and the decision maker have to be two separate people. But I'm just I'm interested in hearing um, your thoughts about how like bias can play a role in decisions that are made, um, especially as they do relate to things that are talked about in Title IX. Um, and so I'm wondering for the decision maker, who I think you mentioned is like typically a principal of a school, um, how like bias is eliminated um, in the decision making process. So I would say that we've done a lot of anti-bias work in the district so that um, people who are in decision making roles have tools they can use to guard against bias. One of the things I'd say is this change of segregating the investigation process from the decision-making process was intended to guard against bias because a feeling was as you were in the process of investigating a complaint, you might be exposed to information that would make it impossible for you to, to check your own bias. And so that's why one person decides these are the facts that can be substantiated and another person looks at those facts and decides whether or not um, a disciplinary action is, is warranted. Thank you. Um, and like kind of relating to that, um, usually like it sounded like what the process is, is a student or someone who um, um, feels they have been like um, not protected um, against something that has happened, talks to a trusted adult or mm -hmm. something. Um, if someone wants to have a trusted adult who's like the same gender as them or something like that, is there a way for them to um, be um, connected with someone who they feel um, can have more of an understanding of their personal experience? So that, that's a really interesting question. And that's something that I 
I've been thinking a lot about since you brought it up. You know, um, one thing I'll say is that we have shared this policy with all members of the faculty. In fact, all members of the school community. You might have um, remembered that 40 page uh, memo that came out earlier. <laughs> um, so there's, there's awareness, I would say, around the community. Um, there may be cases where an individual doesn't have a trusted adult who is the same gender, right? And so I don't know what to do with that, but um, I'm thinking about it. Well, the, can I interject? Sure. So one of, the, one of the things that is built into Title IX, right, um, is, is this concept of supportive measures, right? And so certainly, even though the individuals, the Title IX coordinator in a formal complaint process, the Title IX coordinator, the investigator, and the decision maker um, have to be three separate people and that sort of prescribed. Within that supportive measures framework, um, there is an opportunity um, to connect complainants as well as respondents to individuals um, who can help support them through the process. And they're allowed to have advocates through the process. Um, and oftentimes, oftentimes students will say, I want my parent to be the advocate, right? Sometimes they want their lawyer to be the advocate. Um, sometimes it might be somebody um, else in the community um, who they just feel is going to support them, um, not only through the process, but also emotionally. Um, so, so there's that opportunity as well. So how does this policy prevent sexual harassment like from happening in the first place? And um, like, for example, like will it educate students or like provide resources or like anything like that? So I think you're a part of that right now and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. We're in this education campaign across the, the district and across the whole school community to make people aware of the district's anti-discrimination policies so that they're aware of, first of all, their protections, but also the, the penalties so that if they are have been subjected to this kind of behavior, they know that they can come forward and they know that they can get some relief, um, but also so that people who are thinking about this kind of behavior knows know that it's off limits and know that the district has processes in place to address it. Um, so our hope is that by this public education campaign, we're going to um, be able to make an impact on some of the behaviors that both students and staff might be experiencing within the district. Okay, thank so, you. So thank you for helping me with that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think my next question just digs a little bit deeper at that. Um, it's just about supporting um, all parties, I guess, involved with any kind of complaint that's made, any report that's written, you know, things like that. Um, so it's not just supporting, you know, through the process, mm -hmm. um, but supporting them as individual humans, right? So it's not just like, don't worry, we, we believe what happened to you and we're going to follow these steps, but it's what can we do for you? Um, and I know you started to touch on like, you know, a, more about resources and education, um, but I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that um, for survivors of any kind of inappropriate behavior. Um, but then also, if you could just answer on the flip side of that, uh, perpetrators. So... I, I can talk a little bit about um, some of the supportive measures that have been implemented in the past. Um, sometimes, apart from whatever the outcome of the investigation is, we can tell that someone bringing forward a complaint is experiencing some kind of a trauma. Right? Whether or not it's able to be substantiated, whether or not um, there is further consequences for parties involved. We often know that the individuals in stress and could benefit from counseling. So if it's a student, um, we can offer counseling services through our school department. If it's an employee, we can offer counseling services through our EAP, which is our employee assistance program. Um, for the individuals who uh, may be identified as, um, well, we'll call, I'll just call them respondents to use the language from the policy. Um, one of the types of supports that's often um, put into place is training. Um, so many times a consequence may not be a suspension or a termination, although that happens sometimes. Lots of times the, the support that we provide for the, res the respondent is training in um, sex 
abuse, uh, harassment uh, so that they can understand the impact of their behavior and they can modify their behavior. And I kind of have another question just about the investigation. If someone who's like filed a complaint and is, has gone through the process of the investigation, will they be able to give feedback if they feel that the investigation was not done in an effective way or a way that um, um, was accepting or um, and safe for like the victim and the people involved? Is there a way to kind of like give feedback and kind of keep improving like the process as it's um, as it keeps happening, you know? So do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think that there are, there are at, at a couple of levels there are. So during the course of an investigation, one of the things I talked about is both complainants and respondents have a right to have an advocate there, right? And it's an advocate they, they choose. It's not the one that the school assigns, right? It, it's their advocate. And so um, certainly that advocate throughout the process has the ability um, to, to question if they think that the process has not been fair or has not been followed. Um, under Title IX um, investigative procedures, there are required disclosures that need to be made to both parties about the process, and within that, they're given the opportunity to provide additional information, sometimes ask follow-up questions during an investigation, um, and sometimes that in the process, um, you know, the, the questions are filtered actually through the advocates and not directly with the individuals, and that's to try to help. Um, in terms of safety. Um, the other thing that happens is that ultimately, um, you know, a decision maker will make a determination of responsibility, right? And there'll be recommendations um, that, that come out of that. And both parties then under Title IX have a right to appeal that to a higher authority. Typically that would be John, or Superintendent Provost, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, um, and, and, you know, and there are only limited mechanisms under the law for what the basis of the appeal might be, but there is that, that level and that potential as well. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, Title IX does give individuals a cause of action, right? And so if there was a real, you know, if, if Title IX wasn't followed, if, if there was a real problem with the investigative process, right, um, that's a potential for lawsuits. There's the ability under Title IX to go directly to court or to go to the Office of Civil Rights, which is part of the Department of Education. Um, so there are legal pieces that are built in um, and there's also the supportive pieces through advocacy and through the ability to provide additional information before final determinations are made. Um, so you actually know what the evidence that's going to the de decision maker is actually going to be before they see it. So it's, it's not perfect, right? <laughs> um, it's the system that we've got. It's, it's the regulatory process. Um, but there are some mechanisms built in. Um, thank you. Yep. I think this next question is um, kind of just in an effort to just increase general transparency, um, but for, for students specifically, and it's just a question about confidentiality. Um, I know that s teachers, faculty, there's, you know, everyone's kind of a mandated reporter, a mandatory reporter, mm -hmm. so if they hear something and they think someone's in an unsafe position or in danger or could possibly be in any of those situations, um, something does need to be reported. Um, but I was just wondering if um, either of you or both of you could highlight kind of wh what that looks like, who, who um, you know, if a student has something that happens and they need to, they want to go talk to a, a faculty member, kind of what that faculty member, ha like, has to share um, and where things go from there. Sure. So I'll start, although I suspect Attorney Taylor will be able to fill in some <laughs> blanks here. Sure. Um, I want to distinguish between two concepts you brought up. And that one is mandatory reporting. That applies when we believe that a student under the age of 18 was a subject of abuse or neglect. And in that case, um, if a mandated reporter feels a threshold is reached, they have to communicate that to DCF. Um, 
they have the opportunity to share with the individual what they're doing, especially if the individual is old enough to understand that they're doing uh, a filing. And they have the option of sharing that with the, the family if they, um, if they feel that there's a reason to do that. Sometimes it may be a member of the family who's bringing the information forward, right? Um, so that's different from Title IX. Title IX really puts the um, individual who has the complaint in the driver's seat. And Title IX doesn't, I believe, can't go forward in, without the um, individual's consent. Am I right about that? Not quite. Okay. So, so there are some situations where the, the district can make a, a determination that they can move forward with a Title IX. But they always have to take into consideration whether the complainant wants to move forward with a formal Title IX process. Oftentimes, uh, well, I won't say often, but sometimes the reasons why a, a district might move forward with a Title IX, even if somebody doesn't want to, is perhaps you have a situation where um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, an allegation against a staff member, right? Um, and so there, it, it is not, it's not just a, a, a student on student issue. There's certain power dynamics and other potential legal considerations. Sometimes it's because even maybe if there's one complainant that moves forward, it's regarding protections with respect to a, a, a you know, a potential violation with respect to a larger portion of the student body, right? And so there might be a, a, a reason why that Title IX complaint um, procedure still needs to be followed. So, but but I can say that Title IX does does very clearly make it makes it very clear that before that determination is made by the district, they have to consider the the wishes of the complainant. Um, and sometimes complainants will really want supportive measures and not to move forward. And that that can be okay in some circumstances. Um, so that's the more finessed version. But, As I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's always the exception. Yeah, that's good. That's right? why you're here, right? <laughs> um, so our next question um, is about um, mostly what's communicated to the parents, uh, caregivers of the students that are um, involved in whatever situation may come up. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that not every student comes from a household where they will be supported um, by the caregivers that are in it. Um, and I'm just wondering how that's accounted for um, in this entire process. Do parents have to be notified? Um, do students get a say in whether they're notified? Um, so just general questions like that. <laughs> Yeah. So typically, um, families, parents, guardians do legally need to be notified. Um, and I do want to, I know that we're talking primarily about the high school, right? And so we're talking about older students. But Title Title IX protects students as young as those in kindergarten, right? So, so in, in a lot of situations, it'll actually be the parents who are making complaints because students have a hard time advocating for themselves. Um, but, you know, the district, again, although they, let's say you have a, a parent who's not supportive of a, of a complaint that their, their child made, but it's a good faith complaint, and the Title IX coordinator determines that there's a basis for moving forward with it, um, the student can have an advocate during that process that they choose, um, and um, the district would ultimately be the one making that determination about what it, whether it moves forward. I also think um, that if a student finds themselves in that situation, but they do want to move, they've articulated, I, I want to move forward with a formal complaint, um, they can also ask for supportive measures around that issue as well, um, because that's a reality for a lot of students. And that's not something that would be prohibited at all by Title IX. Um, so, you know, can't, can't you know, hide the fact that an investigation is moving forward from parents, that, that wouldn't be permissible. But certainly supportive measures can be taken to help support that student. Um, and just really quick, um, just jumping off of that, what exactly is told to caregivers? Um, they need to be notified, but is it like, 
all of the details of the specific case? Is it broadly, here's kind of the general disclosure that was made, here are the steps that we're taking? Just wondering what that looks like. Typically, parents would be provided the the documentation. They may not be in all the interviews, right? But but they typically would be provided um, the the information um, that is disclosed during the process. So the investigative report, notices that go out to parties, those types of things. Thank you. And then one last question. Um, how will students be protected from other students um, if they um, feel that something, like they've been har sexually harassed or something, like um, just because socially like news will spread and um, sometimes people may not believe the victim or, um, or it just um, becomes something that people are just talking about a lot. Um, how does this kind of prevent students from you know, kind of being the target of a lot of, um, just a lot of different conversation and stuff like that. So this policy, like all of the district's anti-discrimination policies include a prohibition against retaliation. So one thing that um, will be made aware to the respondent is that while the investigation is going on and even afterwards, they are not to retaliate against the individual who made the complaint. Uh, the district will do its best to try to um, maintain confidentiality. However, as you point out, there may be cases where some of the other potential witnesses are other people in the school community. And so some um, level of, of word may get out. Um, and so then that comes to protective measures, right? Um, it's about um, trying to educate everyone who's involved in the, edu in the situation with the sensitivities around it, asking them to bear in mind the rights of both parties, really, because, you know, if and if you're communicating the information about an investigation to others not involved, you are, you're harming both the, the complainant and the respondent, right? Um, and then also in, in some situations where we feel there may be danger, there are additional protective measures that can be done to protect the two individuals who may be at the core of the um, complaint from each other. So um, safety plans can be created. Students can be kept on separate floors, separate classrooms, separate entrance and exits. And those are all things that we've done to try to protect students from each other. And, and to that larger point that you're talking about, sort of it becomes, you know, larger than just the investigation that's happening, the social consequences to things. Um, you know, in addition to retaliation protections, if that stuff were to spill over into bullying conduct, right, that is that is something else that the district has in another procedure, um, but, but that would be appropriate for response as well, um, because those are other legal protections students have. Thank you, and I'll point out that that'll be upcoming on another episode of Policy <laughs> Chats. <laughs> Thank you so much for the conversation. Help. Thank you for helping us to unpack that for students and other members of the community. Uh, I really enjoyed our time together today, and I'm sure that others are really going to benefit from this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice meeting you both. You as well.